sort of assess the effectiveness of these projects, we're going to look at three outcomes that are being collected on a regular basis uh, in the Philippines. So these are a combination of uh, news reports and uh, police documents. We're able to figure out to what extent there are attacks that are carried out by jihadist groups, which in latter years declared allegiance to ISIS, especially al Qaeda. Similarly, we have information about criminal violence. And criminal violence is kind of a catch-all term for any kind of uh, criminal activity that also includes violence. So kidnapping, extortion, burglary, um, things of this nature. And then lastly, we have violence that's associated with the New People's Army, the, the armed group associated with the, the Communist Party. So let's look at the first chart here. So in the, as I mentioned to you, this expansion took place leading into 2013. So the, the big um, vertical bar here is kind of dividing the pre and post zones here. And what I've done is, uh, because we recognize that the types of places that receive projects may be a little bit different from the types of places that didn't receive projects. And in fact, they differed on two main um, variables. One, if you were politically connected, you were much more likely to get a project. And secondarily, if you had higher levels of jihadist violence, you were more likely to get a project. I was able to match them in 2011 and 2012. So if you notice here on the left-hand side, all both the, the group of villages that had a project and the group of villages that didn't have a project look identical. And that's using a, a, a sort of a technique called matching. Um, and then when we look afterwards, we see two very different trends. So in the places that received a project, it's kind of a flat trend. Essentially, you know, there's a slight increase in the level of violence, but it isn't statistically significant from a completely flat thing. Whereas, in the places where no project took place, there was actually a reasonably large jump upwards. So, by making this comparison, the uh, sort of apparent effect is that actually these projects successfully reduced the level of jihadist violence in these zones. Now, in comparison, when we look at the level of criminal violence, Again, we're matched in the pre-period, so 11 to 11, 2012, they look quite similar. Um, we see exactly the opposite trend. So in the places where there's no project, there was a slight decline, whereas the places there was, there were projects, there was actually a slight increase in the level of criminal violence. And then before we talk about kind of why this took place, we'll lastly look at what happened with NPA violence, violence associated with communist violence. And in fact, we see no effects in either direction. So pretty flat, obviously, because of the matching beforehand, and um, flat afterwards. So why did this take place? Why do we um, recognize this? So here's a sort of a, a uh, summary of, the, of what took place. There are a couple of really important um, things to understand here. The first is that um, this investment in local uh, infrastructure projects did not happen in a vacuum. And in fact, it accompanied a uh, protracted political process in which the government of the Philippines was actually engaged in negotiations with the Moro rebels. And in fact, in 2014, not too long after this program was inaugurated, we actually saw a peace deal. And uh, so the fact that these projects managed to reduce violence was sort of uh, matched with this legitimate political process. And so you can see here uh, you know, members of the, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front you're shaking hands with negotiators from the government. On the other hand, when it comes to the communists, there was no uh, legitimate political process going on. So no discussions going on between the, the CPP leadership and the government, and that continues to this day. Although President Duterte just before Christmas suggested he may uh, restart doing that. Um, another important factor here is that when it comes to the criminal violence component, is that actually it may be the case that some of these insurgents were sort of shifting out of uh, sort of terrorist attacks, if you will, and just shifting over into extorting um, projects. So a new road project comes along, and they realize that it's much more lucrative to go to try and extort the construction workers trying to build the project, rather than going to do terrorist attacks. So there is, appears to be some kind of trade-off between these types of violence. OK, so let's now briefly talk about the Afghanistan case. So the, the, the companion program um, in Afghanistan, known as the Commander's Emergency Response Program, uh, was first authorized in 2004, and they spent multiple billions during the 2004-2011 era. And to give you a sense of kind of the trajectory, 
this, the expenditures here very much match the levels of troops that I showed you in that large chart. So in the early days, when the government was still very focused on Iraq, it was a relatively modest investment that they were making in this program. Once the Obama surge begins, though, we see a huge amount of money flowing into the, the surge program in Afghanistan. And just to kind of see where these activities were spent, it was throughout the country, but primarily uh, in Pashtun uh, zones in the south and east. And importantly, these projects were spent, these, these local sort of small infrastructure projects, were implemented in two different kinds of places. So the first kind is what we might call a control, that is government control, or controlled by uh, you know, US military and, and Afghan uh, military. And also places that are contested, so where the Taliban, Akhani Network, and other insurgent groups are contesting control. And the level of control was largely determined by the number of uh, troops that, that the U.S. in particular were able to deploy in place. So to give you a sense of what the footprint looks like in these different places, um, in Khost district, um, there was this humongous installation. I mean, it's not even that large. It's a port operating base called Fab Salerno that had about 1,000 troops, which is about a battalion. In contrast, in these contested areas, which, is, which are kind of more peripheral, um, a typical foreign uh, installation looks like this, a combat outpost. And this particular one is called Kapkiding in Nuristan. And there you have, like, platoon. You have, like, 60-ish guys that are there. They're living in tents, um, and therefore they're much more and so we look at two different outcomes. So the first are improvised explosive devices, those bombs that I pointed out to you earlier that can you know, uh, flip over and sometimes destroy uh, vehicles. And then second, all bombings. So these are bombings that are carried out against any target, not just foreign troops. So when we look at it, we find actually two very different effects. So uh, in the dotted line here, you can see in unsecured areas, those are zones that are contested, these small projects actually increase the level of violence. So uh, as you can see, it comes up. And in the secured zones where you had large American installations, it actually reduced the level of violence. And this is specifically against the foreign troops. Similarly, when we look at bombings, we have a uh, similar effect. So um, in the weeks after these projects are started, there's a reduction of violence in the secure districts versus an increase in the unsecured areas. Now, when I went back and did the math to kind of figure out what the implications were based on the size of the effects over time, and kind of looking at specifically the projects where I could track the dollar amounts that were spent, we found that, I found that in contested areas, the projects probably produced about 100 to 110 additional attacks over two years. And in the controlled areas where they actually reduced violence, probably 42 fewer, so overall, the expenditure that we're able to account for probably increased violence by on the order of you know, 60, 70 uh, attacks overall. So why might this have been? So insurgents, including the Taliban, are not stupid. In fact, they're very smart. And if they recognize that US forces in these small installations are attempting to build small infrastructure in order to win over the hearts and minds of the population, they will try to stop it and very understandably attack both the projects and those troops. However, in zones where there, is, there are large military installations and those, and those foreign troops are able to protect these projects, it's much more difficult. And in fact, it appears that in those places, these projects worked more or less as designed by employing local people, um, making them feel more positively towards the so I'm, I'm sort of coming up to the end of my time here, so I'm going to wrap up briefly with kind of this idea. So I asked the question here, when does aid work? And I, I guess we should put work in, in quotation marks. So from the perspective of a government or an occupying force that's attempting to sort of um, put down an insurgency, when do these um, uh, policies achieve their, achieve their goals? So the first is, and this one is, I think, sort of the most positive spin on things. When these kinds of aid projects are paired with legitimate political process, they can actually be reasonably successful. So in the case of the MILF uh, negotiations um, with both the Aquino and, and the administration, 
there was this ongoing and legitimate political process that produced um, a change in legislation that allowed the Monsamora area to have a great deal more autonomy. So the Moros were able to achieve something very important to, to themselves. And as a result, <coughs> there was quite a bit of confidence, and these projects successfully won the war. On the other hand, with both the communists and with the Taliban, throughout this period, there was no accompanying political process that was remotely legitimate. Similarly, it appears that combining these activities with security assistance helps to make their uh, makes them more likely to be successful in reducing violence. So, when it's accompanied with security forces policing, like we saw in the Afghanistan case, they're more likely to succeed. Nonetheless, we recognize from both of these uh, uh, initiatives that even though under certain circumstances they did succeed at reducing violence, there are the potential, there is a potential for unexpected side effects and backlash. So, in the Philippines case, there was this big increase in the level of criminal violence, whether associated with extortion, uh, maybe as these people are no longer carrying out the terrorist attacks, they shift into other activities, or maybe there's just more stuff to carry out, um, you know, sort of typical gang activities against. Nonetheless, we saw this increase in criminal violence. And then similarly, in the Afghanistan case, um, in these contested zones, uh, the insurgents responded by actually increasing the level of violence. So this, this backlash effect. Just as kind of a side note, um, obviously policymakers have been super interested in this, and many of them have consulted with me about what they should or shouldn't do. Most recently, I've been spending time with the German Ministry of, De of Development, who do quite a bit of spending in Afghanistan, and the Philippine National Police's uh, Community Relations Office, who are attempting to do outreach to communities and uh, zones impacted by the communist insurgency there. And the message to them is actually sort of complicated, right? Because it isn't that you should or shouldn't do activities. It's instead that there's um, kind of this trade-off that you have to understand. That yes, you can achieve certain things, but it comes at the cost of other things. And in fact, in the case of a lot of the aid in Afghanistan, generally speaking on net, it appears to be largely counterproductive. And so, um, although the, the Germans didn't really want to hear that, because they spent you know, many hundreds of billions of euros, um, they are, at least what they told me, reconsidering some of their, some of their expenditure. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. I'll say thank you. If you're interested in any of the more of the details, each of these has kind of like a more developed paper with a lot more charts and kind of justification on my research page. Um, I also talk about these projects in some of my classes. So um, I, do, I teach a class called Conflict in Asia, which touches on a few of these, and um, also a political conflict. That, thank you very much, and I'm excited. Thank you so much, that's great. Um, I'm going to let you call on uh, folks who want to ask questions, but we want the first question to be from an undergraduate. So, undergraduates, I would love to hear a question or comment from one of our undergraduate friends. Great, go ahead, please. My name is Grace, uh, and this is kind of uh, less about the particulars of the research, but just out of curiosity, what made you choose those particular regions uh, as opposed to, I know you mentioned others. Yeah. Um, so I went to Afghanistan in 2012 to do a research project on natural resource related conflicts. Um, and once I got there, it became clear that this kind of foreign investment was also a major driver of conflict. Um, and so I wrote a separate paper on the natural resource question, but then I got really interested in learning more about this. So from 2012 until the present, I you know, worked on this repeatedly. Um, but one thing that happened is after the sort of uh, withdrawal of the troops and kind of the change in the environment there, it's actually become quite a bit more dangerous, unfortunately. And so then I started looking for other places to work. And um, the Philippines, as so all the Philippines work that I've done has been jointly with a colleague at the University of California, San Diego, who's Filipino himself. And as he said to me, Bernard, we in the Philippines, we've got communists, we've got Islamists, we've got this crazy drug war. If you want to study conflict, this is the place to go. So um, <laughs> since 2016 or so, I've been working with Nico in the Philippines. That's, that's kind of my origin story. Um, so the, the chain of events were 
uh, are thinking about here is sort of something like U.S. builds some infrastructure project in the village and then the telephone escalates their violence and the cost of it. And so it, I'm trying to think about that. It seems to me there's maybe two different things that keep happening there that would lead to that same result in the village. One is that the actual total number of Taliban attacks is increasing, right? And, and this is just causing more global attacks nationally. The other is that they were going to attack over here. Now they attack in that village because of that development project. And it's just moving the attack from place to place, but not increasing the total number of attacks. Yeah. Um, so, so the way I get at that, um, so the analysis that I did in advance was actually district level, in part because of this displacement question. So. So there's sort of two answers. One is, I think there's a lot of displacement within districts going on. But when I look across districts, I actually don't find any spillover effects. So it appears that, generally speaking, because the, the interesting thing about the Taliban is that it's actually not a very um, vertically integrated organization, right? So they have these different cells in different places. Each province has its own shadow governor. And even districts have kind of semi-autonomous uh, leadership. And the reason for that is that they're getting killed all the time by special forces, both Afghan and US. And so they kind of maintain this set approach. So I actually found that between districts, there's almost no displacement. So if, if you have a kind of a, 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 a project here in this district, it's not the Talibs or other insurgents are coming over and attacking it. There really had to have been somebody there kind of pre existing to, to do the attacking. So, John, speaking that's what I find. Yeah. So my question is also going to be on Afghanistan, but um, I was wondering if could, could it also be, in a way, outbidding the U.S. control and public provisions of good in general with the yeah. areas? Because Taliban does have a state building objective in itself that yeah. they actually, I don't know the things about Philippines, that's why, but could that also play a part in why Afghanistan results were different then? For sure. I mean, so the Taliban have been have done a lot. Of, so particularly on judicial things, that's probably their, their strongest sort of claim to fame is because Afghan courts and even some of the traditional shuras are really inefficient and regarded to be quite corrupt, the Taliban have kind of their alternative justice provision system. And in fact, during the same period, 2011 to 2015, they had these like mobile courts that would go around and adjudicate disputes in different places. So I do have a couple findings that it appears that violence not related to the insurgency, so that's like interpersonal clashes, tends to go down a little bit with these projects. So imagine in those contested areas, you see this big increase in insurgent violence. At the same time, you see a small downtick in the level of like interpersonal violence. Um, and then sort of from a statistical side, it looks a little noisy, so it's not clear that we can really nail that down. But there is some evidence that they are kind of doing both a kind of violent strategy, but then also you think some kind of non-violent perspective. Well. I just want to make it clear, it, just, it seems to me that you are suggesting this infrastructure building effort actually is not contributing to the peace building process. According to your three suggestions, first, the legitimate process, and the second, more security measures. Actually, my, I think even with these two measures alone, I think the violence can be reduced even without this infrastructure building effort. So what is actually the independent role of this infrastructure building? So I think that the, the main role is kind of as a um, adding fuel, if you will, to those other processes. So the idea is that imagine you have an, on, an ongoing negotiation. And this is what happened in, with the MILF. You have this ongoing negotiation. Both sides are making promises for the future. So the MILF say, we will demobilize our fighters. The government says, we'll send you a block grant that's worth a certain amount per year. Right? Those were kind of the main terms of negotiation. And so the government, in trying to sort of lure them into signing and everything, thought to themselves, well, we're going to essentially use this aid to kind of give the population a taste of what the peace dividend will look like. And so I think the argument would be that without that very kind of costly demonstration that both they're capable of following through with their side of the bargain, and also kind of to give people a sense of what it really looks like, it may not have been possible to nonetheless follow through with the, with the peace deal in that case. And on the other side, I mean, what we found in the Afghanistan case is that really just using kinetic force has not been successful at reducing the, the ability of the Taliban to, to fight. And sort of the whole theory of McChrystal and others is that you, know, you have to do this sort of much more sophisticated approach. Now, it appears that the combination on its own also has not necessarily 
dealt with the overall strategic situation, but automation definitely functions better than it on its own. Do you think that well, the Philippine program was a government program, right? Yeah. Whereas the American one was a U.S. program. Do you so, think? So just to sort of clarify, so it was officially a government program <coughs> in the Philippines, but a lot of it was foreign money. So for example, from the World Bank, from the Japanese, and. It's always hard to kind of like tease out in what ways the U.S. is involved because they sort of have their fingers in many different situations in the Philippines. Was our kind of yeah. Uh, so like the question is like, does it matter like who implements it? Like to set like maybe people use different strategies when they see that it's a your government that actually implements it, or it's, if it's a foreign force like the Americans, they may change like become more violent, whereas the other one they force more crime. So I think I think that's true, and many many scholars would agree with you. Um, I think the countervailing argument would be that many Moros kind of regard the Manila government as a foreign force, um, and so that not that different from someone else, Christians from far away who are coming to try to vote them. Um, that said, you know, folks that are from Manila or involved in the Filipino government are much more likely to have some experience that's relevant cultural uh, affinity, language abilities, all this kind of stuff makes it much more likely that they can, kind of on the information side, on the soft skills side, much more likely to be able to do the job. So your findings, do they have any relevance to what the lessons, are they consistent with why some of these things work in Malaya and didn't work in Vietnam? I think that's, there's something there. Um, one of the, Obviously, historians argue about this quite a bit, but one of the things that um, the British did in Malaya that's very different from what the U.S. did anywhere was a very sort of punitive, uh, well, well, two things they did. One, they actually did mass population displacement, right? They essentially took almost all Chinese communities from the peripheral zones and moved them to KL and to these, these new communities, right? So that was like a very extreme action that like the U.S. was not willing to do, either in Vietnam or in the Afghanistan. The second is that they um, engaged in a much more aggressive kind of like denial strategy where, um, you know, they, they basically stopped in many cases like food, all kinds of goods from going into known zones of, of sort of sympathy, right? So in some sense, maybe the argument one would make is that you either have to be incredibly brutal or you have to be kind of like very accommodating and kind of the U.S wishy-washy strategy where you do a lot of atrocities and then you also kind of sort of try to win over people's hearts and minds is not going to be successful from like a very strict military perspective. Now I'm not saying that normatively I agree with any of this stuff. Um, so I mean that's one way maybe you can think about it. And the ethnic question? In, in, in the Malaya case maybe? Yeah. Or? So I mean that's a big difference between the sure. two cases. Right? Well I mean the, the, the huge Chinese settlement population pre-existing was a major difference, right? And um, I mean, Afghanistan and Philippines both have quite complicated ethnic layouts, right? And the Taliban were primarily Pashtun, but they also were allied with some other Islamist groups. The, in the Philippines, you have the Moros who, you know, in some sense are ethnically distinct, but only so 